Hi everybody and welcome to this very short presentation, just 30 slides and we're going to be talking about STEMI and really precisely about the problem with STEMI and the way that we talk about myocardial infarctions and the use of the word STEMI. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with the term of ST elevation myocardial infarction and Within paramedicine, probably for the last 20 years, we've had a lot of guideline changes which are about using thrombolytics in practice when we diagnose a myocardial infarct. Now, tools that we're using to diagnose a myocardial infarction these days are based upon finding ST elevation on an ECG. Now, there's a few problems with that. We're going to be talking about ST elevation and the term myocardial infarction and what that means to us as paramedics. So this slide is a really good overview about the problem that we have. And it says that the current guideline recommendations about the way that we treat MIs is flawed because of our terminology use around STEMI and non-STEMI. And in fact, these three fellows are proposing that it's actually held us back and will continue to do so if we don't start changing the way that we discuss and manage STEMI. So let's talk about some familiar or maybe unfamiliar phrases that are used quite commonly when we're talking about the management of acute coronary syndrome in paramedicine. So these three, I'm sure you'll be familiar with STEMI, non-STEMI, and some of you might have heard of ACO, or acute coronary occlusion, or a near occlusion, and that just means that there's insufficient blood flow to perfuse the tissues past a block in the coronary artery. So another term that's quite new, that's been around for maybe only three to four years, is the term OMI or OMI. And what that means, it's an occlusion myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction. So considering that the cost of chronic heart disease is about a quarter of all hospital budgets and Cardiovascular disease is a huge problem and an ongoing problem. So it's not even just the time that the person's having the infarct that's the problem, it's the ongoing cardiogenic shock or, or heart failure that the patient has afterwards, which becomes a big burden on society. So you've got to think that it, at the moment it's 25% of our hospital budget, but they're estimating by the time that 2025 comes, which is only five years now, welcome to 2020, is that it'll actually become almost half of the hospital budget, 45%. So cardiovascular disease, never forget it's that number one, it's that, it's that one of those top on the list of the primary problems that we have as a society. Now the terms, these um, terms that we've been using for, you know, within paramedicine about ACS, these have been around with us for quite a while now, and some of them, you know, they've gone back to the early 2000s. So STEMI became a fashionable term in the 2000s. We, our research started pushing us towards identifying MIs much earlier. And before that, we had used pathological Q waves or Q wave terminology in the way that we identified people who were having an MI. The thing about MIs is that the Q-wave happens after the fact, it, it happens towards the end and it's the, the last remnant of an ECG change and we know that it's too late to do anything as far as thrombolytics go by that stage when the Q-wave is happening. If we want to make a difference in cardiac health, ongoing cardiac health for patients, we need to catch them while the ST elevation is happening or why the while the MI is actually happening. So around uh, 2010 onwards, which is actually not that long ago, it's only in the last 10 years, um, many ambulance services started implementing STEMI protocols. And generally we discovered that uh, 
an MI was related to the changes on an ECG that were ST elevation related. That I guess is, you know, the easy pick of the low hanging fruit back then was to say, well, it's a myocardial infarct because that person's having ST elevation on those leads. It was also around the time that paramedics started getting university degrees and getting more educated. And we were able to take on newer knowledge and learning and our, our guidelines and our protocols started becoming more evolved and higher level thinking. We got new drugs, new drugs that uh, we could use when people were having an infarct to try and minimize the infarct size. The other thing too that you've got to remember is that ambulance services, they're KPI driven. So what that means is that um, we report back as an ambulance service, we report back to other agencies, including the government, about how well we're treating certain categories of people. And because cardiovascular disease is such a huge burden, one of our KPIs that we often have to meet is trying to manage these cardiovascular patients as best that we can within paramedicine. So we've developed KPIs, you know, key performance indicators where we are required to have to improve our patient care delivery in that area. Lastly, that there's a big push, you know, based on that to try and shorten that door to needle to balloon time. So what that means is that uh, we were hindered a lot by in the past about having to get patients to the ED or to the cath lab to get treatment for an MI. Now these days, now we have the thrombolytics or we can go straight to a PCI cath lab. It means that we can treat our patients a lot better. So there's this great push to minimize that time taken and you know, heart muscle is critical and it's very time dependent. Okay, so unfortunately, the term STEMI, it restricts our minds into thinking that an acute coronary occlusion is diagnosed reliably and or only by STEMI criteria, and that the ST segment is the be all end all for diagnosing a myocardial infarction. And there's a lot of problems with that, and our ambulance service guidelines are a pretty good mirror of that problem in the industry at the moment, and that um, for some places, there has to be, you know, X amount of millimetres of change and the monitor has to say meets ST elevation, etc. For us to be able to actually instigate any treatment for that patient with the use of, you know, for advanced procedures such as thrombolytics. Now that's, that's a huge problem because some patients don't develop ST segment elevation like what we would say is being typical. And an MI can be uh, produced in other ways that aren't just an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And that's what we're going to spend some time on talking about now in the future slides. So our biggest three problems. We overestimate, overestimate STEMIs in the fact that we quite often call things that have got ST elevation a STEMI when it's not. We're not well trained when it comes to recognizing things other than STEMI that cause ST elevation. We're under treating non STEMI. So, one, we're not recognizing patients who are potentially having an infarct, but it just doesn't show as being ST elevation. And that brings me to the third, which is not looking for a STEMI equivalent. So something that should be recognisable as being a pattern for a myocardial infarction, but we're not recognising that it is, and hence not treating it. Okay, this fantastic little table, you can see there's a, a reference down the bottom of the slide there. But just have a quick look through that. So this, this was a massive study, and they were basically essentially comparing patients who had um, myocardial infarctions, those that had ST elevation changes and those that didn't. And when they looked at the history and the background of these patients, 
you know, one of our myths that we think about is that non-STEMI patients aren't as sick as a STEMI, that they're probably healthier patients or aren't quite as severe, etc. Now, if you have a look through this list, you'll see that on the whole, besides, you know, I only think there's a couple in there maybe, they're actually less, everything else they actually, their current recently smoking, there you go. On, on the whole, they are actually a very much unhealthier group of people, this non-STEMI group that don't have these typical ST elevation myocardial infarctions. They are generally sicker people. So with this second myth, there's some confusion about the fact that uh, an end STEMI and a STEMI are really different and that we should manage them differently, that the pathogenesis is different, that um, because of the way that they are in the heart, that the treatment shouldn't be the same for them. And that's actually incorrect. So if we have a clear non-STEMI case, it should be treated the same as a STEMI. There is actually no difference. It's just perhaps what we're seeing on the ECG is slightly different, but the actual problem underlying the underlying um, acute coronary occlusion, the blockage, is the same. They may be being uh, they may be being represented differently on an ECG, but the actual problem, the underlying problem, is the same. So the guideline should be the tr the same. The use of thrombolysis, the use of PCI needs to be the same. It's about getting our education up and better and recognising those STEMI equivalents. Or maybe just chucking out the whole term of STEMI. So we have focused on the STEMI patient and essentially ignored the non-STEMI. We have put them into a category where we, on a basic level, we treat them similarly with maybe aspirin, GTN, morphine, etc. But at a higher level, and it's essentially that part that actually makes the difference to ongoing cardiovascular problems, that that higher level treatment, which is now taught by most paramedics everywhere, is essentially being cut off from patients who don't have that perfect STEMI on the ECG. Uh, we're talking about a huge amount of people that we're technically not treating. Okay, lastly in this little piece here is about the fact that not everything that is a STEMI is actually a myocardial infarction and, and our education needs to improve as paramedics to recognize at least the big five mimickers of a STEMI, of ST elevation. So those big five mimickers are pericarditis, left ventricular hypertrophy, left, left bundle range block, ventricular rhythms, paste rhythms go in that, and also benign early repolarization. Our curriculum you know, when we're teaching about ST elevation, needs to also cover those changes as well. The big mimickers of ST elevation. Can you tell the difference? And if you can't, well, you shouldn't be calling a STEMI a STEMI. The other thing that we need to think about is the STEMI equivalence and it's not so much of being a STEMI equivalent, it's a myocardial infarction equivalent. Okay, so we're looking at changes on the ECG that represent an OMI, ACO, whatever you want to call it. Let's just try and get away from STEMI. It's the fact that a patient is still having a myocardial infarction, but it's not represented as typical ST elevation. So, Probably the three big ones that we're talking a lot about these days and that you'll easily find more information on is Brugada, Wellens and Winters. The last thing that has been mentioned over the last few years, which is really important to talk about too, is AVR and the importance of that lead. Now, most of you will have grown up um, knowing that there is a significance for AVR, but certainly when I started, we just forgot about that lead and we didn't even talk about it at all.
So as we get smarter and more educated, we start working out, you know, what we're actually looking at a bit better. So let's talk about Brigada. So Brigada, it's a genetic disorder about a mutation of a gene that's in, it's usually hereditary, eight to 10 times more common in men. So testosterone could account for some of those differences. So essentially it's a, um, a sodium channel problem in the heart. And one of the ways that we diagnose it is to give drugs that muck around with those sodium channels. So it is a problem with the sodium channels and we know sodium channels are incredibly important in the heart. If you wanna know more about sodium channels, go and watch Mark's electrophysiology lecture on ECGs and channels. Okay, so what it is that we see is that we see ST elevation in the right precordial leads and it's associated with sudden cardiac death, particularly in young adults. The ECG manifestations are often concealed but can be unmasked when we give a sodium channel blocker and also fever, interestingly, when a patient gets a fever. So they can get other conduction defects as well, including first degree AV block, intraventricular conduction delay, right bundle branch block and sick sinus syndrome. So those can be other signs of Brigada as well. So what does it look like? Okay, so in A, which is this one on the left hand side, you can see what the precordial leaves, that's leads one, two and three, right here on the front, um, what they are usually meant to look like. Okay, and you can see that normally we don't have these uh, bizarre looking STT changes. So you can see that that is a, a fairly um, obvious change in for a Brigada pattern. Now, even more confusingly is that there's actually a few different types and even the one patient can have, you know, a couple of different types depending on what they're doing, what stress they're having and how far, you know, whether they have a fever or we give them a drug, we can actually make them alternate between the different types of Brigada as well. So it generally has this coved ST segment elevation, so a coved kind of shape, coved meaning like a dip, with at least two millimeters of J point elevation. Now the J point's right at the end of the, the, um, the QRS. Okay, so if you go to the end of the QRS, that's the J point. So there's at least two mils of elevation at that point and it gradually descends followed by a negative T wave. So we have that sloping down and then the negative T wave. So type two has the saddleback and that's that more coved, a more kind of saddle in the middle with at least two point again elevation and at least one mil of ST elevation with a positive or biphasic T wave. So biphasic means that the T wave goes above and below the line. And if you look at V2 in, oh, in type one, that looks pretty obvious actually, yeah. In type 1, you can actually see that really kind of um, dip down of the T wave. And in type 2, it's not so obvious, but look at the lead V2 and you can actually see where the T wave looks much more biphasic in that one. Type 3 has either a coved like 1 or saddleback like 2. And it's got less than 2 mils of J point elevation. So type 3, as you can imagine, it probably doesn't really get seen. It's probably mostly unnoticed and it's actually not, it's not rare in healthy people, meaning that it can be just a normal anomaly of the ECG anyway, which makes it hard to diagnose. Okay, this next one is called Wellens or Wellens syndrome and it describes a pattern on the ECG that represent a pre-infarction state. Now the thing about Wellens, which is really interesting, it's, it's found in people who've got pretty severe coronary arteries disease. And what can happen is that it, um, well this is speculation actually, because they're not entirely sure. But what's happening is the coronary artery is actually um, blocking them and unblocking, blocking them and unblocking. 
may be caused by coronary artery spasms, could be caused by um, you know, increased cardio, uh, cardiac workload of the heart, but the heart is periodically um, getting, getting oxygen and blood flow through the coronary artery and then blocking it itself. So it's a worsening cycle over time where they're almost infarcting and then coming back, infarcting and then coming back, but in a, a much smaller amount. And um, so on that point, that last point there, some theorize that coronary artery spasm or a stunned myocardium cause it, and others postulate that it's repetitive transmural ischemia reperfusion leading to myocardial edema. That just means that, like I'm saying, it's, it's blocking and then unblocking, and the edema is swelling inside the heart. So that, ear, that area is inflamed and it's um, representing as changes on an ECG and it's, it's basically going to infarct or might be infarcting, but it kind of hasn't got there yet. So, but it's, it needs to be treated similarly because it's, it's basically happening. So it's a very serious symptom of something that's about to happen if it isn't already happening. So it's not always an acute process and it can develop over days or weeks. The ECG pattern actually develops over time and also is still developing when the patient actually doesn't ha actively have pain, which is quite interesting. So the ST segment and the T wave pattern can appear to normalize when the person's actually in pain or into things like um, hyperacute T waves, um, you know, causing this pseudo normalization. Now, or it might even go on and develop actually into ST elevation too. Okay, so type A. Type A and type B, have a look at those and the difference between them, they're pretty different. So type A being 25% of cases and it's more of a biphasic pattern. Remember biphasic above and then below the line, especially when we're talking about the T wave. It's more likely to be misrecognized because it's non-specific and it be quite, can be quite a normal pattern in some people. Now with type B, it's 75% of cases. So this is the majority deep inverted symmetric T waves. Now remember with T waves, they should never be symmetrical. <laughs> All right, they normally always got that sort of one side is flatter than the other. Whenever we see symmetrical T waves, we know that there's a problem going on. And of course, they evolve over time. So it start, what starts off as an A, which is quite often missed, will eventually develop into a B. Here's a fantastic picture of a type A. And, um, you know, there is ST elevation there present in V2 and V3. And most people who know what they're looking for with Wellens these days would look at that T wave, the biphasic T wave, and would pick this as a Wellens, even though it is quite unrecognized. I actually think it's um, when it's like this, it's actually not too difficult to pick it up. So question, do I treat this as a, an MI? Well, I think it'd be really hard. I think that we know that um, a Wellens can infarct and when they do infarct, they usually do end up pushing into that ST high ST elevation pattern. So I think that one, that makes it easier for us to diagnose. Um, bring on snap test troponing in the back of the truck, I say, because that's what we really need. If I did a snap test of troponin and um, they're really quick these days to get the results back and I had elevated troponin, then yes, this would be a good one to start more advanced interventions in the back of the truck. This is a tricky one. And here's a, a nice type B. Now this one's actually, this, you know, the problem is when we say um, inverted T waves, a lot of people think ischemia, um, but it isn't necessarily. In this case, it's uh, associated, yes, it is associated with ischemia, don't get me wrong, but it's actually um, a more sinister sign of something else that's going on as well. So these symmetrical inverted T waves are a big problem for this patient. It's a, sh it's a sign that they've had ongoing um, ischemia reperfusion injury, that they've got this part of the heart that's actually quite damaged. This is, this is an infarct that's about to happen. 
Okay, the last one in this group of three that I wanted to talk about, which were the, the myocardial equivalents on the ECG, is the De Winter's wave. So the De Winter ECG pattern is um, associated with like an anterior STEMI equivalent that represent, it's presenting without obvious ST elevation, but instead it changes the shape of the T wave. It was first reported by De Winter in 2008, so it's 12 years ago now. So key diagnostic features include ST depression and peaked T waves in those precordial leaves. The De Winter pattern is seen in, in around 2% of acute left anterior descending artery occlusions and it's under-recognised by clinicians. Unfamiliarity with this high-risk ECG pattern can lead to under-identification and under-treatment, of course. And patients may be instead misidentified as non-STEMI. That would be a really great follow-up project if anyone's interested in doing it. Okay, have a look at that. And, you know, straight away, the, the thing that... Uh, sh that strikes me as abnormal is the the takeoff point for the ST segment is really low behind, below the isoelectric line and that symmetrical tall peaked T wave. All right, so that's what De Winters looks like. So we've got tall, prominent, symmetric T waves in the precordial lead, so in all those chest leads. We've got an upsloping ST segment depression. So it starts low in the takeoff point from the back of the QRS. We don't have ST elevation. Um, we have ST elevation in AVR, and I'll show you that in a minute. This is why AVR is so important. And normal morphology for ST elevation MI may come before or follow on from this. So just like Wellens can develop with ST elevation that looks quite normal later, so can De Winters. So we might have this patient, and I'll show you what that might look like. So here's one. So this wouldn't fit our normal STEMI criteria for treatment. What we're looking at here, and we might talk about amongst ourselves at the moment, is the fact that we've got these hyperacute T waves. So we could be saying, oh, it's, you know, maybe it's a myocardial infarction waiting to happen. But no, this is actually happening. This is actually an infarct happening now. And this was 20 minutes before we got to the ED, and then this is 20 minutes afterwards. And it wasn't that the infarct happened 20 minutes later. It's just that the ST elevation came 20 minutes after. All right, so the infarct was actually happening 20 minutes ago, probably an hour ago, really. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention is about the lead AVR and how it's a really important lead when we're looking at coronary arteries disease and what it can tell us about what's going on in the heart. Now, this isn't necessarily a STEMI equivalent or an absolute sign of myocardial infarction. AVR can be for lots of things and that little list there that's on the right hand side. Um, it also can be used to identify types of tachycardias and everything, pulmonary embolism, um, misplacement of the ECG leads, etc., um, tricyclic overdoses. So it actually, it's a really handy lead to learn about and understand, just as though the others are, are important about De Winter's waves, etc. AVR and the shapes that it takes are probably the other part of the education that we need to follow up on to make us a little bit better in that advanced area of being paramedic leaders. So. I'll show you an ECG, which is a really good example of an AVR. Now, this is, a, this is an infarct that's happening. And if we weren't looking at that lead of AVR, there's nothing in the STEMI criteria that we use on the road which would make us pull out our thrombolytics or rush this patient off to a cath lab. But I can guarantee you that this patient is having a massive MI and the only sign that we can see at the moment is the fact that there's ST elevation in AVR.
So this is another one of those ones that doesn't fall into that typical category and, and why we are under treating our patients at the moment and why it's so important that we need to get our education up and, and better than what it is. So as a group, not just for you watching this as a paramedic, but this, um, this knowledge that we have about what's going on, just know that it is happening. We are doing studies and research myself, Mark and Sean Thompson over in New Zealand, we're actually um, investigating the current, the current cardiology curriculum around Australia and New Zealand and um, we might extend it to the UK as well, we're not sure yet, but we're looking at what actually is being taught out there and um, we're going to benchmark that, make a benchmarking tool and publish on it soon because we want to make changes in this area and we, we do want to improve the education, the foundational education for paramedics because we know that the industry and the university, they often mirror themselves and they often help to push each other along a bit and we figure that uh, what we teach in the university will help also guide the industry to also uh, implement better guidelines for their staff on the road as well. And we can work with places like NHMRC who do the, the massive big national guidelines to actually get some of that happening in the background and get us treating you know, as paramedics better, um, better treating our patients. So we're going to be continuing the research and stay on top of the changes and obviously you know paramedicine.com is, is where it all happens and hopefully this being early 2020 we can start getting some more cardiology lectures out there and get you guys all watch. If you have any other questions feel free to email me at that email address there and um, otherwise I look forward to talking and seeing you all at the next conference where we're presenting some of this stuff. See you later.